Buenos días a todos. Buenas tardes. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. This is the third session in which we meet in this resilience course, this Pan-American Climate Resilient Health Systems course. As you know, tenemos interpretación a inglés. we have interpretation into English, French, and Spanish. You just need to click and choose the button, uh, the globe button at the bottom. These are, this course has nine sessions every Tuesday and Thursday. Today, we will be evaluating, uh, assessing risks and opportunities for adaptation, resilience, building. We're especially focusing on health facilities. Just a few tips. Please check that your mics are muted. If possible, keep your cameras on so that everyone, uh, so that we can see who is participating. Um, attendance will be verified when you connect to the session, so don't worry about that. The session lasts 90 minutes, so we will be together until 12.30 year wide time. We will have a Q&A, a brief Q Sigo para no tomar más tiempo. Hopefully, uh, you haven't lost much information. So we said that the slides are available to be downloaded. And now we will go to the three presenters. So first of all, we have Diane Mid Campbell Lindrum, Vital Ribeiro, and Judith Harvey. First of all, we have Dr. Diane Mid. He will be in charge of the first presentation. He is the head of the Climate Change and Health Unit at WHO headquarters. He has worked on this topic for over 20 years playing key roles in the first quantitative estimates of global health impacts of climate change, resolutions of the World Health Assembly, WHO global conferences, and the expansion of WHO's climate change and health support to over 30 low and middle income countries. He has written over 100 journal papers, reports and book chapters, a lead author on three IPCC reports, and he has worked on the first health report to the UN climate negotiations. He's a clean, a keen cyclist. He, uh, ha, in 2016, he uh, rode his bike. He went from Geneva to London, um, and in 2021, sorry, first from Geneva to Paris, and then from Geneva to London to hand over the COP26 special report, the health argument for climate action. Good morning, Dr. Diarmid. You have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, bonjour uh, tout le monde. Uh, muy buenos días uh, a todos. Um, yo hablo un poquito de español. Yo, yo parlo assez bien français, mais uh, uh, I'm going to speak in English. Um, I think that'll be gentler on everybody. I hope I haven't confused the translators, uh, to the interpreters too much um, by mixing my languages. Uh, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Um, it's very impressive to see how many speakers, uh, how many participants are here, not just from the Americas region, but from all around the world. Um, and once again, thank you for the, the very kind words. Um, in, thank you also for including the, the cycling. Uh, that wasn't in the information that I shared with the organizers, so somebody must have kindly uh, added that in. Um, but it's it's a great pleasure to, uh, to speak here. Um, and what I'll try and do in uh, 25 minutes or, or so, is to um, to give a little bit of an introduction to why we think this area is so important from uh, the WHO point of view, uh, and then focus quite quickly through into what specifically uh, we are recommending and supporting countries to do in terms of building climate resilience of healthcare facilities, but also combining that with environmental sustainability. And apologies if there's a little bit of overlap with work that you've heard before, including from some of my WHO or PAHO uh, colleagues, 
um, but hopefully that at least shows coherence uh, between the uh, the different offices of, of WHO and PAHO. So now I'll try the uh, the technology. I'll see um, if I can successfully uh, share my screen. So can I just check? Can somebody please just uh, interrupt me if you're not able to see my uh, to see my first title? It's slide. Okay, yeah. Okay, perfect. Gracias. So um, once again, just to emphasize how important we th we think this issue is uh, as WHO. <clears throat> so as our ter director general took office for his second term at the beginning of last year, um, he put the emphasis on the um, prevention of disease and promotion of health as the most important of the three things that, that WHO aims to do. So we claim to only do three things. We claim to uh, try and protect people from uh, health emergencies, including pandemics and so on, which you'll have heard a lot of um, within the last couple of years. We also um, aim to promote universal health coverage. So everybody with access to equitable, equitable treatment and so on. And then we also aim to basically to stop people getting sick in the first place. So the, those are the only three things that we uh, aim to promote. And what uh, Dr. Tedros has done in his second term is to, is to elevate that priority of stopping people getting sick in the first place. So disease prevention and health promotion to be the top priority uh, for the organization. And within that specifically to highlight the impacts of climate change as the overarching threat which un aims to undermine all of the uh, determinants of health, both the environmental and the social determinants of health. We also aim to promote this in a positive way. So we know that climate change poses terrible threats to human health, but we also emphasize that this is the things that we need to do to address the climate crisis can also bring very big health and even economic gains. So we're very much focused on the solutions and a positive agenda uh, for healthy futures. Obviously, uh, the interactions between climate change and health um, are multiple and they are various. Almost everything uh, to do with public health connects in some way uh, to climate change. So we try and make this as simple as possible. Um, we are now arguing that the world uh, needs to do three main things uh, to protect people from the climate crisis and to respond in such a way that we also advance health. So we uh, say that we need to promote the health co-benefits of climate change mitigation in other sectors. So for example, the transition to clean energy will save millions of lives from air pollution and so on, same with food systems, urban planning and so on. That's one of the three. The second is to address the wide range of health impacts of climate change. Um, so we, we know that climate change doesn't just cause one disease, it, it increases the risks of infectious disease, non-communicable disease, um, extreme events and, and so on. And then the third one, and the one I'll be focusing mainly on today, is within health systems and facilities that we need to both strengthen climate resi resilience and to promote environmental sustainability. And we think that, that those two things can come together. It's not adaptation or mitigation, it's the two together. So the top part of this figure is explaining what we think are the objectives for global health. The bottom is WHO's own contribution uh, to this. I'll talk a little bit about WHO's own contribution, but I'll talk mainly about the, that central top part of this figure on strengthening climate resilience and the environmental sustainability of health systems and facilities. But just to emphasize why we take a systems-based approach, not, a, not just a disease by disease approach, and we don't only talk about individual health facilities. And the reason for that, as I'm sure you've already discussed within this course, is that climate change affects a whole series of health exposure pathways, extreme weather events, heat stress, um, infectious disease transmission, and so on. It's determined by many vulnerability factors, uh, both within um, health conditions and outside. And it also is uh, conditioned by the health system capacity and resilience, so all of the core functions of health systems. And all of those determine how much climate change goes on to actually cause these wide range of health outcomes and to damage health systems and facilities. And that's why we consistently say it has to be a whole system approach, a whole a, a transformation approach for the whole uh, for the whole system, because we can't fix this just by dealing with 
individual exposure pathways or individual diseases. And then just to emphasize why it is so important for us to do this, um, this is one of the summary slides from the most recent intergovernmental panel on climate uh, change and uh, climate change report, the health chapter, which summarizes the observed evidence of the effects of the relatively modest amount of climate change that we've experienced up until now in different parts of the world and in relation to different health and health related outcomes. And as you can see, there's no real good news on this slide. Across a wide range of health outcomes, we're already seeing um, significant negative impacts in all parts of, uh, of the world. And that, that's why we consider this such an urgent agenda. And so we emphasize that we need to strengthen the, the key public health uh, functions that, that most, um, for example, centers of disease control or, or most national institutes of public health are responsible for. So we have to improve climate informed surveillance and we have opportunities to make better use of weather and climate information to put in place early warning systems for heat stress or infectious disease and so on. Um, we have to work with the most important resource of all health systems, which is the health workforce, to ensure that not only do we have enough of them and that they're you know, suitably supported, paid, equipped, uh, but they also have understanding of the links between climate change and health. We also have to work not just within the health system, but also to look at the determinants of health. So, for example, to ensure that our uh, water and sanitation programs are also resilient to climate change, that our food security and nutrition programs are resilient to climate change and so on. And then we have to address the specific issue that climate change and health um, often falls between the cracks in terms of um, being supported by everybody, blessed by everybody, um, but in terms of receiving financial support, it often falls between the cracks of vertical health programs and vertical climate change programs. So these are some of the things that we say need to happen within the overall public health functions. And now to bring this back uh, more directly to health systems uh, themselves. And this is work that we've uh, been advancing just within the last few months uh, within, uh, within WHO. Um, when we're trying to combine the ideas that we have to improve the overall performance of health systems, uh, so, for example, to improve universal health coverage and uh, WHO and partners measure coverage of um, universal health coverage using an index which is recorded for pretty much all of our member states. <laughs> so that's on the Y axis, the vertical axis. <laughs> axis. So we want everybody to be high on the vertical axis. We're also aware um, that some countries are doing more than others in terms of specifically ensuring that the health system is resilient to climate impacts, both acute climate impacts, extreme weather events and so on, but also the, the stress of, of climate change. And we uh, measure that, we have um, an index of that. It's still quite a crude index, but we're already able to score quite a lot of countries as to whether they have high climate resilience in their health system or low resilience or, or whether we don't yet have data. So ideally, we want every country also to be in, in green. And then the final dimension of this is that um, given that uh, healthcare is now responsible for about 5% of, of carbon emissions globally, much higher in some countries, in some countries it's as high as 10% or perhaps slightly over, <laughs> we want every healthcare system to be aiming to be on the left-hand side of the graph. So the ideal target is to be in the top left-hand corner in a green. So you have a really good health system, it has relatively low carbon emissions per capita, and that it's also specifically making itself resilient to climate change. And of course, depending on where you are in the world, <clears throat> if you're in uh, a sub-Saharan African country where you, you have relatively weak resources for your health system, you'll probably have a relatively poor UHC um, index. You probably have relatively low carbon emissions from, a health, uh, from your health system, probably because you don't have enough access to energy in your health system. So here we want countries to move, if possible, vertically uh, up the scale. Um, if you're in a very um, high income country where you may have, in fact, be using a lot more energy than you really need to uh, to power your health system, you may have an un effectively environmentally um, unsustainable or inefficient health system, 
we want you to move basically to the left hand side of the graph but still stay high on that UHC index. Um, and the ideal is that you are you know, in, in a system which is using the energy it, it needs in order to um, to provide really good health, uh, uh, health a really good health system, but also you're taking account of, of climate risk. And we have really good case study examples now of even middle income countries or low income countries which have really good health systems and facilities uh, which provide really good coverage, really good um, service but are also relatively environmentally sustainable. So this is probably one of the core messages that I wanted to get across in this um, lecture is that this is how we try and bring all of that together to say what we think the ideal health system looks like for uh, the 21st century. Being a WHO, being a technical agency, we publish guidance, we publish frameworks. Some of you uh, may be aware that we've published a um, a, an operational framework on building climate resilient health systems, which we first published in 2015. <clears throat> and that's shown in the, 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 the figure on the left-hand side of, uh, uh, of, um, of this slide, where we outline how countries can build on the core building blocks, which are common to almost all health systems. Um, almost all health systems have some form of um, leadership and governance, uh, but they work on health workforce, they work on health information systems and so on. Um, and what we were describing is how you can build climate resilience into each of those um, functions. That's the outer ring of this diagram. What we've done just within the last few months is to update that guidance. We have a working draft of that guidance, which also now integrates environmental sustainability and low carbon into each of those functions. So what we're promoting is a system-wide uh, approach um, through which we add climate resilience to, to the core of health systems, but we also look at um, bringing down the, uh, the um, carbon emissions where they're too high. And that includes um, bringing down carbon emissions from the health supply chain, because the health supply chain is actually responsible for about 70% of healthcare's carbon emissions. Some of it occurs in the facility. Most of carbon emissions from healthcare actually come from what is bought into the resources that are bought into. Uh, health facilities. And now to bring this more directly um, to the health facilities themselves, we, in addition to taking that health system-wide approach, we've also published guidance which is more specific on the health facilities. And here again, we're trying to, to be quite simplistic to try and boil it down to a few things uh, that we want countries to, uh, to focus on. So we've basically summarized this in, in four main domains. Uh, we say that the most important part of a health facility or a health system is always the health workforce. So in a minute, I'll, I'll describe a little bit you know, what we promote in that area. Um, we also emphasize that wherever you are in the world, um, healthcare facilities should have access to a reliable source of, uh, of energy in order to provide any even basic um, healthcare services. Uh, we also emphasize, and this is particularly a problem in, in, in low income settings, that you should have reliable access to water, sanitation, hygiene, and, and, and management of healthcare waste. And then the final part is that you should have access to at least the core infrastructure technologies and products in order to, to provide those services. So we describe those four domains, and then uh, within the guidance, we describe what should happen under each of these domains in order to uh, promote environmental sustainability and resilience. So this is a quick outline of that uh, of that guidance that uh, aims to deliver on those uh, functions that I've just described. I won't read out everything on, on the slide, but what it aims to do is yet yeah, to build climate resilience while also optimizing um, uh, sustainability, uh, and then aims to yet yeah, guide people, uh, support them in monitoring, implementing interventions, and continuing to revisit this in order to build climate resilience and environmental sustainability over time. And then just to talk a little bit about um, how we see this in terms of the risk that climate change brings, um, and we can consider the wide range of hazards that climate change brings in terms of extreme weather events, but also slower um, changes such as the spread of climate sensitive diseases or sea level rise and so on in some contexts. That bring, brings exposures uh, to the health workforce or to infrastructure 
um, or to the critical services that um, healthcare facilities need and to the communities themselves. And then we also need to understand that risk is also driven by the underlying factors of social, economic uh, determinants of health, environment, institutional, political vulnerabilities, and so on. So we have to work particularly on reducing the exposures and reducing the vulnerabilities if we're to reduce the impacts on healthcare facilities and to the people that they serve. And again, it's important to bear in mind all of these dimensions because a, a hazard, you can have the same hazard, um, which will have very different effects on a healthcare facility uh, or a population depending on their vulnerabilities. If the, if the population has relatively good social and economic conditions, um, if they have um, accountability, responsiveness of their health systems, they're likely to have much lower impacts uh, than one in which populations are not well protected either by the social um, determinants of health or by uh, good health services. Uh, and so just to bring that back quickly to uh, what that means in terms of these domains that I that I outlined, again, you have the, the drivers, the, the challenge of climate change out onto the, uh, the left-hand side. And then within healthcare facilities, we're giving guidance on how you work with the health workforce, uh, water sanitation, hygiene, energy, infrastructure technologies and products and so on. And each of these is described in some detail uh, within the guidance in order for us to consider how you, you build resilience, but also how you reduce those environmental impacts. Um, because uh, in many ways, there's, there's healthcare facilities under, undermine their own mission if they're, for example, not managing their healthcare waste or if they're causing excessive uh, pollution into the environment and affecting the health of the, uh, of the population. So that's why we think it's part of our mission uh, as health professionals to always uh, try wherever we can to reduce environmental impacts. Again, I, I won't go into detail on the, uh, on the guidance, but um, just to, to give an example, if we take uh, one of those domains, the health workforce, we give uh, guidance on what we uh, aim, what we think needs to be achieved uh, within the health workforce uh, component of building climate resilient and environmentally sustainable uh, healthcare facilities. And we talk about human resources, we talk about capacity development and training. We also talk about the role of health professionals, um, not only in delivering care, but also as one of the most trusted professions in the world that can serve as advocates for action in the community and raising awareness within uh, the community as well. So the, the social role uh, of healthcare workers as, uh, as, as leaders within almost all communities um, in the world. And then just to give a little bit more detail on the, uh, on the guidance, um, we not only give the general guidance, but we also have more detailed tools, including in the form of checklists, uh, so that individual healthcare facilities can assess their own vulnerabilities um, to, to climate change. And now we're updating those as well to, inc to include environmental sustainability. And again, it's in the context of trying to shrink the risk um, wherever possible, reducing the hazard, but also trying to keep people out of harm's way by reducing exposure, but particularly to reduce their vulnerability in order to reduce uh, the overall uh, risk that is posed to the facility, the system and the community. And again, just to give uh, some details of, uh, uh, of, of what we uh, take um, people through in going through this guidance, uh, we also um, recognize that a healthcare facility is not just dealing with a particular disease. It won't be a healthcare facility for malaria and then a separate one for di diarrheal disease and then a separate one for non-communicable disease. So it may often be hit by compounding risks, different health risks um, that uh, may, several of them may be affected by climate change. So you may have a, um, a facility which is dealing with people who are both suffering from heat stress, um, but at, at the same time may have been subject to long-term drought, therefore their water and sanitation may be affected both in the community and in, in the healthcare facility. And so we, we aim to describe all of those risks and what, uh, and what facilities and systems uh, can do about them. And there's uh, an example uh, from the guidance uh, given here that it's an example for, um, from a small healthcare facility on uh, an isolated island in, um, a small land developing state, 
uh, which may be challenged by storms, by tropical cyclones, by floods, uh, by sea level uh, rise across those different dimensions. So what we do is to encourage the managers of that facility or health system planners to consider these different risks and therefore how it may affect them and, and what they may be able to do about it, either in preparedness and prevention or having plans in place to respond to risks when they hit. And I don't want to drown people in, in information. And I, I am aware that as, uh, as technical agencies, we can overcomplicate things, um, but we do um, produce a relatively comprehensive set of checklists for uh, managers to go through and to consider the, 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 the different range of, of impacts. So these probably go too much in, on the side of too much information. Um, and we would encourage uh, systems and facilities to look these, to use these as, as a constructive tool, to not feel they have to do everything on here, but to consider what is relevant to them uh, based on experience from elsewhere in order to consider what they, uh, what, what risks they, they may want to consider within their, their own facility. And as I've been talking mainly on the resilience side, and obviously this course is, is mainly about resilience, but I did also want to keep coming back to this point um, that in many cases, it's quite possible, um, and in fact, something that we think should be done to also to look at the environmental sustainability of healthcare facilities. And here, we will never um, undermine the delivery of basic healthcare. Instead, we're looking for win-win opportunities through which um, there may be a solution which both increases resilience, but also um, it may also save money and it may also decrease environmental footprint. Uh, so just to give you one concrete example of that, and I, I know it's one that um, is already being uh, widely championed uh, within, uh, within the Americas and, and also elsewhere, is the use of renewable energy for healthcare facilities. So in many parts of the world, particularly for isolated healthcare facilities, um, which are off the electrical grid, um, if they have an energy supply, that may often be by a diesel generator, um, which is often inefficient, unreliable, and expensive to run, as well as being polluting. And now the cost of renewable energy provision has fallen so much that the best solution um, in most cases around the world is now to provide renewable energy, which has the advantage of improving the service, reducing the cost, and also tending to be more resilient, for example, when a healthcare facility may be cut off through a uh, through a, uh, a flood or, or disruption of infrastructure. So this is an example of the, the triple wins uh, that we're uh, identifying. And just to say that this is something that um, uh, WHO is actively uh, involved with. Uh, so uh, for example, even in some of the poorest countries in the world, subject to many challenges in a country like Somalia, uh, we're able to promote the uptake of um, renewable energy as the best energy pollution for healthcare facilities uh, in that environment. And we think this is a solution which is very, should be very widely applicable uh, throughout the world. Um, and in fact, the only barriers to implementing this are mainly generating the finance upfront in order to make the investment, which will then pay off over time. But it's one of the, uh, the, the things that we're pointing to as, 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 as a, a real flagship intervention that we can promote. In just the last uh, few minutes that I, I, I wanted to take, just to, um, to put on the table a few of the things that WHO specifically uh, is doing to advance this agenda. Obviously, uh, WHO and PAHO are evidence-based organizations. It's, it's one of the core things that countries and other partners look to us to do. Uh, so we spend quite a lot of our effort in putting together the, the evidence, not only on the the challenges that climate change presents to health, but particularly on the solutions. What is the, the evidence for the effectiveness of, it, of different interventions that could be made? We also work directly with countries um, to survey their, their own progress in implementing the health response to climate change. And this is a, uh, some results from our, our most recent uh, Health and Climate Change Global Survey report, which looks at how well countries are doing, but also what their challenges are in implementing the health response to climate change, finance um, being the, uh, the main one that they're, that they're challenged with. So that's one of the, uh, the functions that we uh, lead as WHO. Another is uh, 
on the leadership function. Obviously, as, as WHO and PAHU is one of the voices of, of public health, we have the opportunity to uh, engage in global climate change discussions. And one of the um, things that we wanted to promote and put on the table is that we have made a lot of progress um, from the health community recently in the climate change uh, discussions. And so for the first time at COP26 in Glasgow, we had the first ever health initiatives under the presidency of a COP. And what we did there was to invite countries to sign up to make two commitments, one to strengthen their health resilience to climate risk. The second is to build climate resilient and low carbon health systems. And we now have in fact 65 countries which have, have made that commitment. Um, it's a relatively easy commitment to make because the, the entry bar is only to carry out an assessment and to develop a plan, but we also encourage countries to go much further. And as you can see, there are a good number of countries already within the Americas uh, and elsewhere throughout the world which have signed up to this commitment from the largest economy in the world to, to small island developing states. So we think it's relevant to everybody. And in the middle of last year, we established the, the ATTACH, the Alliance for Transformative Action on Climate and Health, to bring together uh, the countries which are asking for this support with technical uh, experts, UN agencies, multilateral development banks, and so on, to support the delivery of these commitments. And that's something that we would invite um, anybody basically to, to, to join the ATTACH, um, to bring your capacities or your needs um, together to, so that we can leverage the support collectively to learn from each other in order to have more impact. Just very quickly, one of the other things that we do uh, from the WHO point of view is uh, to promote the voice of health professionals as one of the most effective advocates on climate change and health. And in those very kind words that were made about me cycling uh, towards uh, the Glasgow COP, that was actually part of a partnership um, through which we had a declaration, a letter, which was signed by organizations representing two thirds of the world's health professionals, that letter was then signed by Dr. Tedros. I took that and a copy of WHO's report, cycled that over to London, but then I handed it over to a group of health workers uh, from the UK National Health Service who cycled it up from London to Glasgow to deliver it to the COP because they are um, such a trusted voice which is working directly on the front line of these risks. And just to emphasize why this is so important, um, health professionals, uh, doctors, but even more than doctors, nurses are the most trusted profession on the planet. So it really matters that what they do in their professional lives and how they speak out on the issue is translated onto um, in, into the climate uh, into the climate discussions. Very briefly, just in the last uh, minute or two, um, we also take this very seriously from the WHO point of view. We have committed to becoming carbon neutral by uh, by 2030. Um, that was actually a, a speech made in. Uh, the US in on the last World Health Day. Um, and basically, the organization is now organizing to try and mobilize uh, ourselves in order to deliver that within our own uh, operations. The final thing that I wanted to put on the table that we uh, do after the evidence and after the leadership is in country support. And that is the most Cinco minutos, part. Perfecto, gracias. Um, that is the most important part of, uh, of what we do. Um, so obviously, climate change and health is a very diverse agenda. It can be a confusing agenda. We've tried to make it as simple as possible uh, in the work that we do with countries to lead them through a series of questions um, to help to build resilience of their systems. So we, we try and envisage the kind of questions they may ask. And we'd be interested in your feedback as to whether these are the right kinds of questions. Um, but we encourage countries to ask um, what are the impacts uh, that climate change may bring to them? How do you develop a good plan? How do you get that plan financed? Um, what are the specific interventions that should be included within that plan? And then how do you monitor progress and keep coming back so that you can inform performance over time? And we now have a very comprehensive set of technical guidance um, that we uh, have developed in order to answer each of those questions. And so if you go on our website, you will see, if you click on the learn more, there will be more description and the link to the technical resources, such as the ones that I've just described in order to support you in that process. We also uh, work directly with countries to try and facilitate access to finance 
in order to, um, to support implementation. And here I have to be a little bit modest on WHO's um, behalf. We're not ourselves a major financing agency. It's not really our job. We're a policy and technical support agency, um, but we aim to facilitate access to support countries to develop proposals and wherever we are able to mobilize resources to support countries uh, directly, because we do know that this is now one of the major challenges that countries are facing. So um, that brings me to the end of, uh, of, of my presentation. Um, once again, thank you very much for the invitation to, uh, to speak here. I'm, I'm quite humbled by the number of people I see participating and from around the world, not just in, in PAHO. Uh, and we'll, we'll be very uh, pleased to um, work with our PAHO uh, colleagues and the other agencies involved in this, uh, in this course in order to answer any further questions and to support this area of work going forward. So thank you uh, very much and, uh, and, and back to you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dermed, for your great presentation. We already have a lot of questions for you and we're going to select some so that you can answer at the end uh, of the presentations. Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Vital Ribeiro, architect and president of the board for the Healthy Hospitals project in WHO and also architect in the health division of the state of Sao Paulo. And he, so he's also president of the Healthy Hospital Project in Brazil. He has a master's in business administration from the Getulio Vargas Foundation in management, environment and health sustainability. And he works in the health administration of the health department of the state of Sao Paulo, coordinating the state um, waste management project. He also worked in the uh, surveillance agency of Brazil and the Getulio Vargas Foundation. In, he teaches in different postgraduate courses. Thank you so much, Carlos, for your presentation. Uh, I'm very impressed with the number of participants. Very glad to be here. Starting to share my screen. Let me see. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Okay. So uh, I, I'm sure that everyone here uh, has already thought about the different uh, social, economic, and health conditions of different countries and how the population are affected by climate crisis and as well as their respective contribution to cause this crisis. So uh, analyzing health system is in different regions, give us a very rich view of this reality. And it's also an opportunity to learn on how to deal with uh, the climate crisis, uh, especially from the perspective of health equity. Uh, to discuss adaptation and resilience uh, in health facilities is an urgent and complex task. A lot is being done all over the world. And I give my two cents here by presenting the work of we are doing uh, in Brazil at the organization I belong to, the Health Hostos Project, uh, or PHS, as we call it in Portuguese. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, about PHS, uh, PHS mission is to make Brazilian health system uh, an example uh, and having a leadership in facing environmental and health crises, such as uh, the increased pollution, loss of biodiversity, but we work mainly on climate change. Uh, PHS was born out in 2008 as a, a result of a partnership with 
healthcare organ without harm, an international organization. And today we co-coordinate the activities of the Global Green and Health Hospitals Network in Brazil, including the participation of Brazilian healthcare organizations in the global campaigns uh, like health, uh, Healthcare Climate Challenge and Race to Zero from UNFCCC. The, the Global Green and Health Hospitals Network was launched in 2011, based on agenda of 10 integrated and complementary environmental objectives. Uh, as we can see, the objectives proposed in this guidance document are still current today. And uh, it's interesting to note how they dialogue very well with the uh, 2030 agenda and the main issues on climate action. Um, today, GGAJ brings together 1733 uh, organizations representing thousands of healthcare uh, facilities. Uh, in, in, 81 countries. So participants share best practices and solutions to environmental problems, measuring and comparing results. The global network offer a helpful opportunity for capacity building, identifying priorities and developing shared solutions. This process can involve hostels thousands of kilometers away, but which often face very similar problems. Uh, and it's interesting uh, how rich South-South collaboration can be to promote sustainable innovations and how this help our work in Brazil. We have many partners on uh, Africa and Southeast Asia, and we are working together also with the centers on research and the more developed world. Uh, in PHS, the seed of uh, the seed of our network began with a group of health professionals and researchers from different regions of the country engaged in environmental causes like waste management and chemical hazards, such as the campaign for mercury devices phase out the mercury fear. Uh, healthcare, one of the first campaigns that we developed in PHS. Uh, because the way PHS come, up, uh, come about, from inside of hospitals, having as partners uh, the associations of occupational health, infection control, uh, hospital management, we have grown organically within the Brazilian complex of healthcare organizations. Currently, PHS is a mix of a think tank, advocacy movement, and a strong and diverse community of practice. Besides our 1,600 uh, personal members, uh, we manage the GGAJ in Brazil. Uh, it's a membership system of health institutions. We invite them to develop sustainability practices and environmental management. This network of institutions has today 321 healthcare facilities and 21 health systems that manage other 900 uh, uh, healthcare facilities. We have members institution in now states of Brazil in similar proportion to the distribution of our population. Our network also have public organizations from our levels of management, federal, state, and municipal, and as well as private organizations, for and not for profit, which represent very well the profile of national health system. We also have uh, nine hospitals and two health systems uh, participating in Race to Zero, and we are very proud of this. Each of health facilities or systems must perform at least one of the four main challenges to be listed as an active, active member of PHS and GGAJ in Brazil. Uh, this list of members work 
as a process for supporting and recognizing efforts and engagement, which greatly encourage uh, the participation of all types of organizations. Um, this slide shows the four challenges as our priority programs, which are climate, waste, energy, and procurement. So from the 10 goals of the agenda, we, we developed these four challenges as priorities, but they uh, include the other goals. For each challenge, we offer a strong support for members based on uh, self-assessment, management, and control tools. Uh, we, uh, these tools are customized for healthcare organization and individual support from PHS experts. So we give them individualized support and uh, even very simple uh, facilities can make headway in tackling complex challenges. Uh, the national and global awards and, and the reports encourage uh, and reward the efforts of directors and leaders, as well as enver environmental technicians and health professionals in general. The awards are, are very important for this engagement process. Virtual communities, technical supports, workshops, and other virtual groups and workshops, strengthening the ties, consolidating the feeling of being part of a community of Pretzi uh, with mutual support and common goals. This is important for our work too. And the indicators, the, the dashboards and benchmarking are also per important because we collect a lot of, a, a large amount of data uh, that make, makes it possible to track the performance of each organization as well as establish general conditions and identify trends by sector or by region. This information provides evidence to support managers' decisions at local level and for government too. So we are working hard to improve this process. This slide shows uh, the evolution of the particip participation of Brazilian health organization in the four challenges along the time. As you can see, we are having a, a very good uh, response from the, the healthcare organizations. And uh, at every uh, year, we, we have more participation. About the, uh, the climate challenge, uh, we have important documents. I, I really recommend the, this, this one on the right corner, the, the Global Roadmap for Healthcare Decarbonization. It's produced by the, the GGHH and uh, other partners. We have a Portuguese version for this. And on the other corner, we have this action uh, plan on uh, the, this document on how to create an action plan only in English, but uh, it's also very useful for our members. Uh, I, I want to say a bit about the uh, procurement challenge, also very important. We know how, we, how important is the consumption decisions on healthcare. And we have also uh, documents on, on, on this area, besides the, the, the whole package. We have the global roadmap for healthcare decarbonization. No, oh, sorry, uh, we have the sustainable procurement uh, challenge. Uh, well, where is the document? Oh, sorry, here. The, the guide, uh, this, this sustainable procurement guide, and the self-assessment too are two of our initiatives. The, the self-assessment too are only in Portuguese, some methodology for online form that helps hospital to assess the governance aspects of 
uh, how they are organized for sustainable procurement. Uh, and as you can see, procurement is a key uh, challenge and we have a lot of uh, support for uh, members. Energy is also so super important. So one of the uh, products that we want to show here is the fact sheets for energy efficiency that uh, makes the procurement of uh, equipments uh, minuto, more Vital. conscious. Okay, thank you. So we have this fact sheets for conditional and refrigeration equipment. Uh, and sorry, it's only in Portuguese too. Uh, also the simulator for uh, biodigester that brings the information on how much uh, GAG production could be uh, reached by uh, using a, a digester, reducing methane generated and generation uh, of uh, on-site energy. Uh, these are some examples or case studies of public hospitals that uh, work on energy challenge by using photovoltaic energy and other uh, efforts on energy efficiency. We have very good examples today in Brazil. And these are our waste uh, challenge, one of, of the most popular besides the climate challenge. Uh, in this work, uh, we help the managers to track the performance of the institution and compare it with the it's the results with other of similar size and complexity using very accurate indicators based on the daily weighting of waste generated. So uh, it's important to uh, address these aspects of different institutions need different methodology to, to manage the uh, waste. Uh, here it's another uh, important uh, initiative about uh, the, the plastic project. So we are partners of a global movement for uh, reducing plastic consumption. It's important for climate change and for waste and for many other aspects like pollution. And uh, we adapted the two used in, uh, developed by the Indonesian partners and also on, on Europe, they use it uh, a different tool. So we, we made a mix of these two uh, process to create uh, a, a support for Brazilian hospitals that are joining this project too. So these are some of the activities PHS developed in Brazil. I want to really thank the team. We have the, the, the four uh, ex experts on, on procurement, waste, energy, and climate and the back of steam that also very important and a special thanks for the, the board that supports our actions and all the members in Brazil that are also very important to make this movement, uh, created this momentum. So uh, I invited you to know more about Health Hospitals Project and uh, Healthcare Without Harm, Salud uh, Daniel in Spanish and uh, to be part of uh, the Global Green and Health Hospitals Network. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Vital. Excelente presentación. Y Thank you, Vital. That was a very interesting and an excellent presentation as well. Uh, and there are many questions for you as well. Now, it's an honor to introduce our last presenter for today. We have Judith uh, Harvey, who holds a PhD in engineering. She is a, has a PhD in engineering awarded by Cambridge University. She's a chartered engineer with the Institution of Civil Engineers UK. She's registered as a civil and environmental engineer in St. Lucia and has been a technical consultant on the smart healthcare facilities in the Caribbean project since 2015. This project is funded by the UK's Foreign uh, Commonwealth and Development Office and implemented by the Pan-American Health Organization 
with the local Ministry of Health and Wellness. She has supervised the retrofit of 12 health centers, enhancing the mitigation of an adaptation to climate change. She currently works with uh, post-construction training, facilities management and monitoring for 15 smart project facilities in St. Lucia, ensuring that they remain safe and green. Uh, Dr. Judith Harvey, you have the floor. We're going to look at the Smart Hospitals Project in the Caribbean and to the lessons learned from the project, which illustrate that smart hospitals are resilient. And the presentation is in three sessions, three sections the scope of works as defined by assessments that will illustrate opportunities for adaptation and building resilience. The performance proven during recent emergencies is concrete evidence of what has been achieved by the project and capacity building as promoted by the project gives rise to not only training within the project countries, but also resources that are available on the website. What is the SMART concept? The SMART concept is encapsulated by the equation here, safe, green, and well-maintained facilities. A facility is a unit within a health network. And therefore, its safety is referring to that resilience to the hazards. But the greenness, the environmental friendliness, the fact that it can mitigate climate change as well as be adapted to climate change is very important. And without maintenance, that infrastructure which has been provided and which is so necessary, decays and the equipment can break down. So a smart hospital or a smart facility has these features. And we want to focus particularly on the tools which were developed by the project for assessing the vulnerability of the facility to the hazards which it is exposed to. And these tools, the hospital safety index and the green checklist will be the focus here. The hospital safety index is graded as A, B and C with an A score referring to a high level of resilience whereby the facility remains operational during a hazard event and is able to take in the victims of a disaster immediately after the event. The green checklist is scored as a percentage out of 100, with a 70% score referring to the gold standard. And the combination of these two is illustrated. I am going to show different slides with examples of interventions that were done during the project to achieve that adaptation to climate change and resilience. The first example shown here is St. Anne's Bay Health Center in Jamaica. This chart shows other interventions and I'm not going to list the interventions they are visible on the, the slide, but to achieve safety, the score A on the hospital safety index and greenness, the score of 70% is illustrated by the achievement of these goals here. But the region is exposed to multiple hazards. And therefore, it is important to consider the facility as a unit which contains structural elements, for example, the frame, which would not be collapsed 
during an earthquake, for example, such as what occurred in Haiti, the building envelope, which must remain intact during a hurricane, for example, the most recent hurricane event within the project countries was that in Belize. And the very minor damage which was noticed to uh, roof sheeting in one location is evidence of the good work that the project, the smart project retrofits did in achieving resilience of those facilities. So we have structural and we have non-structural elements, functional elements and green elements within the facilities, all of which must continue to operate during and after the hazard event. The volcanic eruption in St. Vincent 2020 is depicted in the lower picture at Chateau Belair Hospital, whereby the ash fall, although it covered the facility in effect, once the ash was removed, the facility could be reoccupied and service could be given to the people in the area. The upper photo illustrates that location and the vulnerability aspect of the exposure due to that location is something that a project like this cannot control. So the Leonora Hospital is close to the sea and the sea wall was breached by high spring tides in Guyana and the facility lower area was flooded as shown here. It is also important to note that temperature rise and other effects of climate change must also be resisted by the facility to provide for the comfort and the care of those who are using it. And this includes improved access for persons with disabilities, proper ventilation and indoor air quality, efficient, energy efficient air conditioning and fire safety measures. So we have some further examples illustrated here of the interventions that can be used to create a smart facility and the project budget of 46.3 million was used in seven participating countries. The participating countries did not include the British Virgin Islands for the actual SMART project, but the British Virgin Islands team was part of the project's technical implementation team and also received PAHO support. And this example here from the Anegada Clinic illustrates the resilience that was demonstrated during the hurricanes, the double impact of Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Maria about two weeks after the first hurricane, both category five hurricanes and with a torrential rainfall event in between. And in spite of that, there was only minor damage to the exterior components of this facility. But the, the lesson here is that the facility was not only able to provide care, but also served as the communication hub for the island. And remembering that a health facility is a unit within a network, the British Virgin Islands would have been fortunate that Anigada would have been covered by that clinic. On the mainland of Tortola, the People's Hospital, I know there are other, um, there's an, another name referring to Orlando Smith, but I will use the name People's Hospital as was used by our team members in the technical implementation team. And again, this hospital would have served as a strong point in the health network of the British Virgin Islands, providing care during and after the event, as well as serving as a communication hub, a center for the emergency operations 
and relief effort. And this is because it would have withstood that Category 5 hurricane. But the operational lessons which were learned by the BVI are worth sharing with everyone. The importance of the, the staff and the team members who are providing that care. They must be so familiar with the contingency plan that they can almost automatically function during the emergency. And the supplies for the contingency need to be current and usable. Not only that, but the strong points in the health network must be able to compensate for the weaker points within that network. And the communication systems always require backups. Not only that, but the greening process must so cater to debris management and vector control that the aftermath is not an additional disaster with further chaos in the facility. And the facilities and in the network must continue always to improve because climate change is ever increasing the level of resilience that is needed. And on the theme of operational resilience, not only is the network approach demonstrated in this infographic of the SMART project in St. Lucia, where the map shows that a total of 15 facilities around the island were strengthened so that if any area is cut off by flooding or landslide, it is able to support the residents of the region with a, a strong point in the health network, but training of the health workforce. You can see all the people who were trained and that is an important contribution to the functioning of the health system because of the strength of its individual units. Also, the savings of water and electricity on a normal basis are important and in times of disaster, conserve the scarce resources. This list of training events captures market engagement training for contractors, conservation of water and electricity for health staff, which, as I was saying, is so important during an, a hazard event as well as during normal times. Contingency planning, which I just referred to also. The hospital safety index, HSI, and green checklist assessments and baseline assessments that identify those opportunities for building resilience in any particular facility and preventive maintenance, which we are coming to now, and ancillary staff training, both of which provide for that continuity of the efficiency of the retrofit. And the Smart Hospitals Toolkit, which is on our website, has a preventive maintenance manual, as well as a technical guidance document for category five timber. Judith, three minutes. Thank you. Three minutes, Julie. Thank you. For category five resistant timber roofs. This is a prescriptive guidance document and it can be used by builders who know that the regions in which they are operating could experience this level of hurricane or storm. There are other tools also on the website, including the hospital safety index and the green checklist referred to earlier, as well as a retrofitting economic support tool, because it does not make sense to implement a, a smart retrofit unless there is also a case in saving lives as well as financial benefit supporting that intervention. And in summary, therefore, a smart facility 
as created by the project has demonstrated its resilience in more than one country. And just to list the project countries, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, St. Lucia, Grenada, Dominica, Jamaica, Guyana, and Belize were the seven project countries in phase two of the project. And these smart facilities in each country would be expected to and have shown that they can protect the lives of patients and health workers, continuing to function as part of the health network in spite of emergencies and disasters, and operating as self-sufficient units able to expand to accommodate victims of the disaster and to minimize the overall damage to health equipment. Not only that, but they are generating less debris. You will not find the roof of that facility on the land of a neighboring property. And they use the scarce resources more efficiently, particularly in times of greatest need. Thank you. And I apologize for the trials at the start. Thank you so much, Dr. Judith. It was really interesting to hear your presentation. Now we're going to have um, one question for each of you as a way of, of closing today's session. We know that you have been answering some of the questions in the chat and, and all of the questions will be answered um, afterwards via email. But now for Dr. Diarmid from Paulo, I think that in, as we improve sustainability, we will improve resilience, but we need to take into account maintenance of intervention, for example, in waste management, wastewater management. Sometimes a few years after these interventions have been installed, maintenance is, is not kept up. So how do we plan not just interventions and construction, but also long-term maintenance? Dr. Diarmid? Yes, thank you very much for the, uh, for the question. I, I think it's, it's one of the critical questions. Um, so for, for renewable energy, what we hear from partners around the world is that the um, overall economically, it's a good deal even now in general to buy renewable energy. And we hear that from high income sy systems. So for example, um, hospital planners in the UK uh, will take a business case to their finance department and when they originally presented the business case, they said, um, this will pay itself back in eight years because energy costs are so high. Um, and then by the time they came to implement the intervention, that figure had changed. It would now pay itself back in four years uh, because fossil fuel prices are so high. So in those kinds of contexts, there's usually enough money you can put into place a business plan to reserve the, the money to do the intervention in other in low income settings that can be very challenging um and so we have a lot of bad examples of projects which have come in as you've suggested put a solar uh facility um sorry a solar panel on a healthcare facility often just to supply one piece of equipment say the refrigerator for a vertical vaccine program and then the maintenance has has not been there so we, we are, and we're hearing that that's a big challenge, but we do now have some successful case studies of where this can be designed from the start, um, that the, the finance is raised in order to provide a long-term contract, not just to buy the, um, the renewable, the, the solar power, but also to give a long-term maintenance contract for say 20 years, um, and in that time, that would have that that would have paid itself back in terms of the the economics. So it's a really it's a really important question, 
and that we have many bad examples, but we are just starting to get some uh, some good examples. And so the example I was giving from Somalia, they think they have a good model even for low income countries. But it's it's something again that we'll want to continue sharing experience uh, across different partners who have done it who have done it very well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Diarmed. And now the question for architect Vital from Ruby. Yes. How and the strategies, how have the strategies presented been applied in South South cooperation? And do you have any specific exchange? Um, cases, examples from South America, for example. Cooperation among countries. And it was surprising uh, how uh, important became this cooperation with countries uh, like India, uh, Indonesia, Philippines, South Africa. But obviously, uh, the neighbors in, in South America are very important. We have been working with Argentina, Colombia, Chile, and Mexico for many years. Uh, in June, we will have the, the 50 uh, Latin American Conference of the GGAJ network. So it's a good opportunity. Uh, uh, let me see, I believe it will be in, uh, in uh, Colombia. Yes, in, in Bogota. Uh, and it's an opportunity to get more uh, involved on, on this work. We developed together uh, many uh, research and, and, and share experiences, like uh, uh, mainly about uh, toxic products, uh, waste management. So we are part of the same effort on uh, reducing plastics. Uh, discussing uh, the problems of uh, incineration, that it's a common problem in our, the South, the global South, the, the technology that it's not well applied and, and causes health problems. Uh, we developed uh, our research on, on uh, disinfectants. So many materials uh, we could share, translate or adapt for this reality. Thank you for the question, and uh, I hope we could uh, improve this. Uh, uh, I, I invite all the participants of this uh, course to know more about how to engage on this uh, work and cooperate together. Muchas gracias, arquitecto. Thank you, um, architect. Uh, now, uh, this question is for Judith. Es importante, es anónima. Es importante. It's an anonymous question. We need to consider the... We need, sorry, wrong question, sorry. One more minute, please. ¿Qué tipo de materiales de okay. What type of building materials are preferred when it comes to building a smart hospital? Ah, this is a very interesting question because the strengths of certain building materials in earthquake are different to those in hurricane. And of course, there are other dimensions such as volcano and flooding also to be considered. So we would as engineers say that any building material can be designed and constructed in such a way as to be resilient and to be part of a smart hospital. Furthermore, the work retrofitting is using an existing building to minimize that carbon footprint which would be entailed in constructing a new building. So you are starting with existing building materials, which must be strengthened or adapted to suit climate change. 
And one example is the St. Anne's oh. Bay Health Center in one of my slides, where the stone masonry facade was waterproofed to make it more hurricane resilient. So in summary, all building materials have strengths and weaknesses, which can be made part of a smart facility with good engineering and good construction. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Judith. Well, first of all, it has been a pleasure to moderate this session. Your presentations have been excellent. So thank you to the three of you. And thank you also for your use of time. It's been amazing. We have six minutes left. So maybe uh, we can give each of you one more minute for you to make a final reflection. Just one minute. That, that would be very interesting. So it's your time, uh, your one minute now. Uh, Dr. Dayamid, please. Thank you. Uh very much for the extra minute. I think um, my reflection is really just how fast moving this area is. Um, I don't think we would have had uh, almost 600 or almost 550 participants uh, on this kind of course, even two or three years ago. Uh, and I think many of us are learning this as we go along. It's still a relatively new field. So I think these kinds of forums for exchange are really important uh, because, um, for example, I was answering in one of the questions that you know, we didn't have guidance for uh, architectural guidance for healthcare facilities. And then Dr. Harvey came on and, and said, well, we do have guidance for, uh, for them. So I'm already uh, learning. And I, I think that's a very positive thing. So I think uh, just to, to say, I, I think the four are like the attach, like these kinds of courses, are really important for, for continuing to build this uh, community of practice and from learning from each other and, and, and encouraging each other. Thank you. Muchas gracias, doctor. Uh, thank you, doctor. Yes, Mr. Architect. Uh, I was wondering, uh, we are uh, facing uh, a huge challenge and uh, fast transformation of everything around us. Uh, I think the, the low carbon healthcare, it's very uh, important example for the whole economy and productive sectors or in public policies on, on how intense is the transformation we are passing through to build uh, a low carbon economy uh, and a more social justice uh, and transforming the, the global uh, economic system. So it's all about innovation, but innovation in a very deep level. We need to innovate not just technology, but the institutions, the way we think, the process. Uh, and, and healthcare is very important because uh, the health systems are very integrated in the whole society. So if we succeed in, in build low carbon uh, healthcare, uh, it will be very important to think about low carbon uh, education, low carbon, low carbon uh, government services, and not just transport energy and, and food. You know, we need to, to change the whole society and this is being a, a difficult and, and challenging process. So thank you for the opportunity again, and thank you for the audience. Gracias, Vital. Thank you, Vital. So now our engineer, Judith, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Carlos. And I would say, first of all, that the focus of this session has been healthcare facilities as units within health systems. And the comments by my colleagues show that we must not work in silos as individuals without reference to others 
architects and other professionals and other organizations, the overall WHO and the PAHO as a unit within systems. And also that the websites of all of our organizations contain valuable information for the participants. Our website, the Smart Hospital website, I think participants are asking which websites for actual addresses, but if you just Google, you will find this information which has been presented to you today. Thank you. Bien, muchas gracias y agradezco de Thank vuelta. you so much. Thank you to our three speakers. It, this is a great example of transdisciplinarity in this area. Um, and also uh, when it comes to addressing these challenges and thank you to all the participants as well for joining our session and for staying connected thank you everyone have a great rest of the day thank you so much goodbye bye <laughs>